Hi, this is Justin Poi. I am the host of the Imagination Broadcast for Asian Heritage Month. I'm also the honorary patron for the Canadian Foundation for Asian Culture. Every May, we host a huge uh, series of events. Uh, This May is no difference. We have such a packed schedule of virtual events. You really have to come back to our website frequently to see what we have going on. Also new this month of May, I am doing a series of interviews with extremely accomplished Asian Canadians. I think you'll be very surprised to hear some of their stories. They're enlightening, they're inspiring, and they really um, help our next generation to see how they are going to break through what we call the bamboo ceiling. My interview today is the woman who founded uh, Asian Heritage Month in Canada. That is the Honorable Dr. Vivian Poi. Now, if you recognize the last name, yes, she is my mother. Um, She uh, founded uh, Asian Heritage Month 20 years ago, and uh, it has grown incredibly since then. But a lot of people don't know her story before she was a senator. Um, Those of you who met her during her time in the Senate, she had an incredibly full life prior to joining the Senate. She was a full-time mom. She came here for university um, at McGill. She uh, met my father. She became, believe it or not, the carnival queen. A lot of people don't know that. Um, And uh, after McGill, uh, she raised a family, uh, my brothers and I. And then she went back to school to Seneca College uh, for fashion design. She became one of the most well-known Canadian fashion designers at the time. This was uh, during the 1980s. She had um, a a boutique uh, in Yorkville. She was incredibly accomplished and her work was seen all over the place. Uh, Then she got involved in the community. She um, was uh, helping out the Chinese community and whatnot, and then was appointed to the Canadian Senate uh, by Jean Chrétien. And she was the first senator of Asian descent. She has a great story to tell, so let's listen to that interview now. And welcome to the Asian Heritage Month Imagination broadcast. Today I have an amazing interview. It is with the woman who started it all, my mother, the Honorable Dr. Vivian Poi. And it is her 80th birthday today. So, hi mom, happy birthday. Hello, Justin. Now today is your 80th birthday, so happy birthday, mom. Thank you. Now, your birthday is in May, and uh, Asian Heritage Month is in May. Uh, But what a lot of people don't know is that your middle name is May. Um, Is that just a coincidence? Well, the the coincidence could be just with my middle name, but not... Asian Heritage Month. The month of May has always been Asian Heritage Month since you established it 20 years ago. Now, Asians had been in Canada for a very long time. So why did you feel that that was the appropriate time to establish Asian Heritage Month when you did 20 years ago? I was uh, appointed to the Senate in 98, and I was not quite aware of the problems until after I was there. And I was able to see what the situation was across the country. And um, Asians were very low profile, obviously, because I was the first Asian to be appointed to the Senate of Canada, you know, Canadian of Asian heritage. And um, also, uh, uh, having studied Canadian history, I know the history of discrimination in Canada. And I thought it was time to do something about it because Asians somehow somehow were nowhere in Canada. We had sort of slipped in between the cracks. Now, you came to Canada for university. Um, and back then, it was, uh, well, it was quite unusual for people to come here from overseas for school. Um, now, you see a lot of overseas students in Canada now. How would you say that your experience back then differed uh, than, the, uh, than the overseas uh, students' experience today? In the 50s, people did not immigrate to Canada. Um, uh, the, I think those who came... Well, certainly for the Chinese, they were family reunification. So I was really one of the very first so-called international student, except there wasn't that category. And I paid the same fees. I was treated the same way as the students. In fact, I even had health care. I was just treated as a, another Canadian student. And um, uh, so it was very, very different. There were maybe 
12 girls, 12 Chinese girls in at McGill at the time, maybe just as few boys. And that was it. I mean, it was just very, very different from the campus uh, to today. And when would you say that really started to change? I would say really changed probably at the end of the 60s and the 70s, beginning of the 70s, because 1967 was the beginning of the point system in Canadian immigration. That was when people could come into Canada for education or to work, if you have enough points. And that was when Canada opened up to immigration to the non-European world. Now, students on campus these days get a lot of comfort and camaraderie by joining different student associations. There, you know, um, pretty much every university has a Chinese Canadian uh, student association, an Indo Canadian association for students. Um, what did you do for that camaraderie, or, or did you feel like there was something missing in terms of hanging out with people of your own background and culture? Oh, no, I can mix anywhere. As you probably know, you know, I can make friends anywhere. And I did have a lot of friends there. And it, it didn't bother me. Not at all. And there wasn't such such thing as those clubs. I well, did you ever hear from other students or uh, people that also came from Asia and other countries that it was lonely for them not having those types of associations? No, no, we it wasn't something that we discussed. And really, the only thing I could have joined was the sorority of the university. And I'm not a joiner, so uh, I wasn't interested. Well, clearly, the 1960s and 70s were a very different time for Asians in Canada. What would you say are some of the biggest differences between uh, what was going on then and the experience now? With the many, certainly. And uh, in all the... Uh, um, uh, professions as well. And of course, you know, a lot of them went through universities here and they remained here. And that was the reason why uh, there are, you know, and, and once they're doing well, you know, more and more of their families come. And because Canada opened up for immigration and that was really the turning point for Canada as, the, uh, uh, as a, a welcoming country and the multicultural, um, multicultural policy also happened around that time. Now, in the 1980s, you went on to um, continue your studies at Seneca College and um, uh, pursued fashion design. You were a, uh, certainly a role model and a mentor for many of the uh, fashion design students. And um, certainly in your career, a lot of young fashion designers look up to you. Um, but at the time when you were a student, did you feel that at any time you weren't on the same level playing field or didn't have the same opportunity being an Asian student? No, not in fashion. And in fact, I, um, I, there were many in my class. There were only two ethnic Chinese. The other one was a, a, a guy. And I don't know whether he was Canadian or not. And then there was me. And I was the oldest in the, in the class because I already have my family, had the three of you and, and with dad. And, and I was sort of held up by the teachers as a model who, you know, a model student who, who has so much work to do at home. And I was still doing very well in school. So being Asian um, at that time, you didn't feel that there was any, any negativity or anything that was holding you back in any way? Not at all. Not at all. And definitely, I think I feel like fashion. Uh, uh, it doesn't really matter what, uh, where you come from or what color you are. Well, you know, even these days, a lot of um, uh, immigrants and a lot of Asians feel that they are held back or not able to play on the same um, sort of level playing field as everybody else because of their ethnicity, because they're Asian. Um, and it sounds like you somehow had figured out how to make sure that you were being treated equitably and that you were playing on the same playing field. Can you tell me more about that? I think it is the way, I think it, it's really the way I grew up and the way I approach people. Um, I, I've always been treated as an equal. 
And, uh, and I think a lot has to do with, in, in English, it's called upbringing, because I come from a family where my, my, I'm used to seeing people of all ethnicities in my home who are friends of my parents. So uh, to me, you know, I'm just one of them. And I have to say that there are a lot of Asian young people who, uh, uh, who did not grow up the same way I did. And uh, so it, it did make a difference. Also, I was in school for two years in England before coming to Canada. So it really made a difference too. So do you think that it has something to do with behavior and one's own behavior as to why they would or would not be accepted? I think definitely so. But then it, it may not be on purpose because they actually don't know any, any other way of behaving. So it's something you have to learn. When you go to a new country, you have to learn the culture and the habits of, of that country and, and the laws, which are very different from the, where you come from. Well, do you think this is something that um, governments or not-for-profits could get involved in to help immigrants um, sort of learn that behavior and, and, make the, and sort of pave, it, pave the way and make it easier for them? Oh, I, do, I believe that. And it's, it would be, I think, maybe NGOs helping immigrants more so than the government. Government wouldn't know what, the, what their habits or their heritage, you know, from whatever little area of the, of the world the immigrant comes from. But their own group, people who have already been here, can teach the newcomers what is the right way to behave. You know, you don't do so and so, and and this is how you you know you you treat your your friends, your neighbors, or people you come across, and that's extremely important. So I've asked this of politicians, um, especially those who are elected, because when they are elected, usually it's because they've garnered a certain amount of support from their constituency. Um, they might live in a ward or a riding where there's a lot of people from their community, and that's how they get elected. But once they're elected, they are a politician for all Canadians. Um, when you were in the Senate and being the first senator of Asian descent, um, did you feel that there was some sort of um, juggling act and, and, and um, this b constant balancing act between making sure that you're looking after um, the Chinese constituency as well as being a senator for all Canadians? No, I, I actually, I feel I represent all Canadians and particularly all Torontonians because that was my constituency. And, and, but on top of that, I also represented all Asians across the country. So it was actually a much bigger load. And that was why I was, uh, uh, I, the term I used was, I was adopted by all these Asian communities across the country. They keep inviting me to speak and to meet them. And it was great. It really helped me to learn about Canada, but uh, at the same time, it's a lot more work. During your time in the Senate, part of that term was spent as the Chancellor of the University of Toronto. Um, do you feel that being Asian played a role um, or, or influenced somehow your, um, your time as chancellor at U of T? I think at that time, U of T was ready to be diverse or to be seen as diverse. And uh, uh, having a, an a, 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 a ethnic minority, let's say, it, say this way, or never mind Asian chancellor, really proves that the university was ready to be diverse and to accept all these diverse students. Now, it, um, uh, it was great because I think I was really welcomed by a lot of the students there. But at the same time, um, uh, I feel that it is very important that as a chancellor, I represent the university well. And in that sense, um, I, I might have been more helpful to them when I went to Shanghai for them and when I was in, uh, in uh, Malaysia for them and when I was in Hong Kong for them. So there was that more, more of that connection than maybe uh, another chancellor who is from you know, a local Torontonian who can't do that. Now, lately, um, you know, 
obviously there's been a lot of reporting about Asian hate and um, you know even on a broader scale not it doesn't have to be you know those radical violent things but that are happening but even microaggressions um, are you surprised that this is happening because I mean you, you have been able to navigate your life in such a way that you really have made sure that you and certainly for you know me and my brothers have had a very equitable equitable experience in Canada um, are you surprised at what is going on right now wish uh, with the negativity and um, and all of the hate and and violence that's going on no it's expected because of the historic um, racism in Canada to me, Canada was a white country until after 1967. And you can just read the speeches or the laws in, in Canada that uh, it was institutionalized, that racism was. And um, so a lot of that has changed after the Second World War, especially in the 1960s. However, there is always that systemic racism that remained not all Canadians. In fact, I think there are a lot of wonderful Canadians, very welcoming, but there are those few who would use any excuse. Absolutely, you know, COVID-19 was an excuse that, you know, they if they want to hate people, here's a wonderful, wonderful time to, you know, show that hate. And um, because it has nothing to do with um, uh, a a, a, a pandemic. The the last really I, I can remember the uh, the time in the eighties when uh, Asians, a lot of Asians, came into Canada, welcomed by the government, brought in a lot of um, uh, investments and expertise, professionalism, etc., and also students. And yet there was a huge rise at that time in the eighties of anti-Asian uh, racism. And in fact, um, I think that was the reason why Prime Minister Brian Mulroney appointed David Lamb as Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. Now, um, and then of course, since then, we, uh, whenever somebody, maybe their own children can't get into university and then they get upset. And uh, in fact, you know, we, we know certain cases that that was true. So then they said, oh, the our higher institutions are accepting too many of these Asian students. So such as W5, the um, uh, campus gave giveaway and also two Asian article in McLean's magazine. Now, when you look at what's happening right now, um, would you say that not necessarily that it's our fault, but if you look at uh, Parliament, for example, you look at South Asians, they are extremely involved. They're very well organized in community, in politics, and they have a, a, a great deal of representation in government. Um, but when you look at the Chinese community, we really don't have, you know, nowhere near uh, proportional representation at all. And we're not very good at being vocal. Um, would you say that we're not doing a very good job as Chinese Canadians? Yes, it is. It definitely is. It would be, I would say, not for the first generation, but for the second generation uh, in, in these communities. Now, I think the, the say, the, the Indians have the advantage of growing up with English. Now, they, supposing the Hong Kongers who come here, they have a certain amount of English in, uh, in their education. But... Um, just as an example, for, from other countries, such as China, um, they have to learn the English, right? So the language is extremely important if you want to go into politics. You have to be able to express yourself so that people can understand you. And so language is the first thing. But there is really no excuse for the second generation. Um, but then at the same time, you know, the... I know most Chinese parents are not going to tell their children to go into politics. That we know, right? Now, what do you think that um, Asian immigrant parents could do to better prepare their children for life in Canada? I mean, if they're older and they don't have an ability to acquire new languages as easily as their kids, what, what do you think they could do to, make, to help make their children's lives better? I think uh, most Asian parents do 
work towards that uh, because they want to make sure the children have a, a good education. And I have talked to um, uh, sort of first uh, um, the new immigrants who said, you know, they to, they hold two or three jobs just so that their children have a good you know, can go to university. And the parents don't mind that. They want their children to succeed, but usually in a profession like lawyer, doctor, you know, nurse or something like that. Well, that's understandable. I mean, you know, those kind of professions are, well, they're stable and they're solid. Now, one thing I found particularly uh, useful for Asian Heritage Month is for second generation Asians. Um, many of them, you know, they, they grow up with, I mean, friends of their cultural background, but also with all Canadians. And many of them lose their heritage and their knowledge of their culture very quickly. Um, what, what advice would you give to, um, to Asian parents for their children who are born here in Canada? Because I, I remember growing up, um, you know, as Chinese in the 1970s, I, I didn't want to be Chinese at all. In fact, you know, you may recall that I had um, told you about a lot of the racist remarks that were made by people in school and whatnot. And, um, and it was you that introduced me to uh, the Chinese um, uh, culture and the organizations here, such as Mansung, and you got me involved on many of the committees. And, and, and really, that's when I turned around and became uh, very proud of my heritage. Um, what advice would you give to Asian parents who have uh, Canadian-born children here and want to make sure that they don't lose their culture and they stay in touch? Well, I think all parents should encourage their children to, um, you know, keep their heritage. I think heritage is even more important than culture because, because the, uh, uh, a lot of, most of the Asian cultures have uh, hundreds of thousands of years of civilization. So those, that should not be lost. And the children should learn about it. They don't have to behave like what people used to do in the old country, but they, they need to know. I think the more you know, the better. And if you are proud of your heritage, you can actually get uh, much further in life because you, then you have confidence in yourself. Now, I also know of those who don't, who say, well, you know, I, I'm, I wipe it all clean. I just want to be Canadian. But just think, you know, Canada only has a few hundred years of, of history. And, and then somehow something is lacking. And, and can you really be very successful? You know, or can you really be happy in your life? Now, are we sending mixed messages and confusing Asians in Canada? Um, you know, we, we're very proud to use the word diversity to celebrate diversity and um, appreciate everyone's differences. But then with the word diversity, we attach the word inclusion, really talking about how we need to recognize our differences, but then making sure everybody's included. But you know, every major city around the world you go to, there will be a Chinatown. There will be an India town. Um, are we, are we sending mixed messages and saying, you know, keep yourselves amongst yourselves, but then also make sure you're included? Is there some confusion there? No, I don't believe so. Because uh, uh, you want to be included in a country. But you, at the same time, there is no reason why you can't be included, why you can't be a loyal citizen to a country, but at the same time, be, be uh, proud of your heritage. The two are actually, they, they work together. And in fact, they work together very well. I think those who really um, uh, understand that can build bridges for Canada to the other side of the world. If, if you've lost that link and you don't even understand the other side of the world, then you can't do, you know, there's only so little you can do. And you can't build bridges for Canada. So lately, I've been speaking to a lot of the uh, school groups um, and addressing school assemblies during Asian Heritage Month. Um, one thing I'm hearing from students is that they are facing microaggressions and, um, you know, sometimes flat out racism. Uh, they're, they're feeling a little bit demoralized. They're feeling um, not so positive, maybe about the future. 
Is there something you would say to, um, to young Asians who are feeling, especially during this time of you know, increased and heightened reporting on Asian hate, that are feeling uh, down about it? No, they have to stand up for themselves. They have to stand up for their own right. If they are Canadians, just say you're, they are Canadians. And if people tell you to go home, just say, this is home. Canada is home. And in fact, I was um, uh, uh, in conversation with someone else um, who said, uh, who has never been to China. Um, when someone said that to him, go home. He said, well, yes, if you pay my passage. <laughs> I mean, so would you feel that um, Asians that are within uh, sort of going head to head for a particular position, that they're all playing equitably and on an even playing field with other Canadians going for the same position? A lot of them are not, uh, either by their surname, uh, because they can actually speak perfect English or perfect French. And if people see a name, they might say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we will look at the other names first, or if they see the face. Now, uh, but if you can really perform, I know all of us have to work a lot harder, you know, uh, especially in my case as a woman and also as a minority, we have to work a lot harder. But you have, we have to keep fighting it and we have to keep breaking that bamboo ceiling that is still there. I mean, it's still an issue when you know people get a resume and it says uh, Lee or Chong, Wang, uh, Harjinder. Uh, you know, very often people look at that resume and they go, "Oh, this guy can't even speak English. This woman, you know, won't be able to uh, uh, do the job properly." How do we get past that? Well, I think it's uh, first thing first um, with Asian Heritage Month. It's about education, educating entire Canada about what Asians are, what Asians have been able to achieve, what Asians can do. Now, aside from that, individually, you have to do whatever you can to put a foot in the door so that you could show what you can do. And, and you know, you have to work twice as hard. And uh, what you said, can I tell you a story? So a friend, long, long time ago, came and she was hired. She wasn't seen. She... Uh, she was hired as a teacher. Um, uh, she speaks perfect English. And the name is Can. Well, you know this person. And uh, so she was given the job. And when she went to work, the principal of the school was taken aback that she, the principal thought the name was Kent, K-E-N-T, instead of K-A-N. And she was hired on the spot. And then, of course, she was already there and she had absolutely no problem ever since. However, you know, the, the, I, I understand the thing with the name, but she did speak perfect English. Now, when people um, immigrate to Canada, um, of course, you know, it takes them a little while, but eventually they will feel Canadian. But for example, Chinese who come to Canada, they eventually call themselves Chinese Canadians. Uh, um, uh, people from India call themselves Indo-Canadians. Um, and it, it, if, 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 you, if a Chinese person immigrated to France or to Italy, for example, um, they may become a citizen of that country, but they, they will never be seen as being French. They will never be seen as being Italian. In Canada, um, when we um, inherit uh, the, sort of the Canadian identity, um, we become sort of this, this, this dual um, identity. Do you find that that confuses immigrants? Because, um, you know, take the, uh, the last Beijing Olympics, for example. There were, I know there were many Chinese people who were rooting for Canada, but they were also rooting for China. And, um, and, and a lot of people were torn about that. And I remember Asian Heritage Month that year, we did talk to a lot of youth about that sort of dual identity and, and what it feels uh, or what it is to be Canadian um, and then to be Chinese Canadian. Um, would you say that we send out a confusing message? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, the fact that we are, say, Chinese Canadian, Indo Canadian, you know, Iranian Canadian, it's because Canada wanted us to be Canadians. Whereas, you know, the same people going to another country, they are just, I guess, they remain foreigners in, in a sense. 
but Canada wanted us to be part of Canada, which I think is great. And we then I always tell um, uh, other ethnic minorities in Canada, if you want to be a Canadian, you are Canadian first, and then you and then you are you are proud of your heritage, which I think is extremely important for yourself and for Canada. And I I don't think there's any confusion at all. Was that always your position, or did you somehow um, evolve into that? I evolved into it not when I was a student. When I was a student here, of course, I was gonna I was supposed to leave. But the moment I settled here, I felt very strongly Canadian. And in fact, um, uh, so you know, I have always been like that. Ever since probably you can remember, right? Well, where did you get that feeling from? Because you weren't really getting those messages from your country. Well, don't forget, someone coming from Hong Kong didn't have a country. That's we did true. not. I never had a country until I became a Canadian. Well, now people from Hong Kong say can say, yes, I have a country because now Hong Kong is part of China. But I had no country. The British didn't want me. You know, uh, Hong Kong is just a little colony. So I never had a country until I became a Canadian. So that's my country. Now, a lot of people don't know that um, there is Asian Heritage Month during the month of May in the United States. Uh, was that something that was coordinated or was it a coincidence? No, uh, actually, the uh, Asian American and uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month started during the time of Jimmy Carter. It was always celebrated in May and still is. You know, they celebrate every May. And, uh, and that sort of the uh, tradition moved up to Canada among Chinese Canadians. And I know it started here uh, when I did my research before I put, uh, before I tabled my motion, the, the, it started actually the oldest was in Montreal. And then the second oldest was Vancouver. They just celebrated their 25th anniversary. And, uh, and then it started in Calgary. And I was invited to some of the events in Calgary. And I thought, but only strictly Chinese Canadians. And I thought, okay, we need to expand that. It needs to be better than that. And it was based on that. Then when I went back to the Senate, I did the research. And then I realized that Asian Canadians aren't even part of Canadian heritage. So that's how I got the ball rolling. But back then, there were no official declarations of Asian Heritage Month, were there? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And in fact, it was never mentioned. Asians are not mentioned. And uh, I know that in, uh, when I was in Ottawa, there is Black History Month, and the federal government celebrated it. And I wonder what happened to Asians. There is a, a huge number of us, even at that time. Of course, now it's a lot larger. So... Why do you think we've been left out? I mean, Asians have been in this country for a very long time. And if you look at uh, Chinese Canadians, I mean, arguably, we were responsible for ensuring that the railroad was finished. Um, why do you think it's taken this long to get any kind of recognition at all? Well, unfortunately, we, are, we work too hard. We keep our heads down and we keep quiet. We're too quiet. And that is why I don't think that's such a good idea. We're not going to be quiet anymore. We are going to show the rest of Canada what we can do. And um, that was the reason. And then this, this term of model minority, I believe it came from the US. We're not model, maybe a few of us, but most of us are not. And we should be you know, in, included in definitely in Canadian heritage, we are part of Canada. So 20 years later, um, do you feel satisfied with where we are um, in our place in Canada, um, in our place um, as viewed by the government, um, or do you feel we have much further to go? Um, yes, to a, a, a certain extent I am, because we're finally a very big part of the Canadian fabric. And uh, the month is celebrated by mainstream media. It's, it's mentioned everywhere by corporations. And, um, uh, and th the thing is, 
you know, we have to get to the point when we are, we're not told to go home. You know, you don't belong, you're foreign. Uh, we have to get to the point of no, uh, and I don't know when that might be, but the uh, w- when I f- say that I'm not satisfied because there is still anti-Asian racism. So where do we go from here with Asian Heritage Month? Um, you know, you have certainly laid the foundation. Uh, there are so many different individual groups across the country in every province that have their own celebrations and they feel a lot of pride. So no doubt there's um, you know, a lot of institutional memory there to carry on uh, to future generations. But um, where do you feel is the next step for Asian Heritage Month? I would like to see more education, a lot more education. I would like to, to have a, 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 a anything that had happened say with Asian Canadian history, part of the history of Canada taught in school. I think, you know, that is a very big part so that children who grow up in Canada will know that, you know, hundreds of years ago, these people were already here and they are, they are already building this country. So, you know, so that there will be less and less of this racist feeling. Well, thank you very much, mom. It's been awesome interviewing you and thank you very much for taking the time on your birthday happy 80th birthday and uh, happy asian heritage month thank you happy asian heritage month thank you thank you very much for watching the imagination broadcast my name is justin poi make sure you check back frequently to our website to see all of the upcoming events and the upcoming interviews that i will be conducting we'll be posting them every four to seven days so be sure to check back frequently until then we'll see you next time Thank <laughs> you.